Okay, everyone, welcome back to another video on the Roman world and the Roman Empire. Hope you guys are doing okay out there. Today, we're going to continue our discussion on what life was like in the Roman Empire. And specifically, we're going to take a look at what legacies from Roman society still affect our lives today. If you are following along in the notes that I've provided, it's in the Module 6 Stark Notes on the Roman World and Christianity. Specifically, we're looking at Section 3C on Roman society. You can find this at the bottom of page 6 to the middle of page 7 in those notes. Now, where we left off from our previous videos, uh, just how we got to this point. So a few videos ago, we talked about the collapse of the Roman Republic and the rise of the Roman Empire and how they switched from an indirect democracy to an imperial monarchy. We talked about the nature of the government in the Roman Empire, how they oversaw that 200 year period of peace and prosperity that we know as the Pax Romana, how they had a government led by an emperor and run by a competent civil service system, and that they had hundreds of cities connected by roads. Finally, in the last video on our playlist, we talked about people's lives in the Roman Empire and how there was still a great degree of economic inequality between the different social classes. We talked about how slavery was still an important part of their society and the fact that they had patriarchal family social orders. So in today's video, we're going to take a look at some elements of Roman society that we still see in our world today. Um, and one of those most crucial elements is the Roman aspect of public entertainment. Now, it's interesting, you might not think of entertainment as a very important thing, but it was an important part of the Roman world. I believe in my last video when I talked about the differences between the rich and the poor in Roman society, we quoted a Roman senator named Juvental, who used a quote, he had a quote that said, so long as you give the people bread and circuses, they will remain happy. And that was part of the public entertainment aspect of things. In addition to giving the poorer classes food, they also provided distractions for them in different forms. Um, you often found these distractions and these forms of entertainment at some of those large amphitheaters. All right, the most famous among them is, as you can see here, a building known as the Colosseum. We'll talk a little bit more about that in another video when we talk about Roman architecture, but it's the most famous building, the most well-known building in all of Rome, the giant arena where they used to hold these violent gladiator contests. So a lot of you have probably heard about the gladiator games and how they were very popular in Roman society. This was probably the most popular form of entertainment that they had, and yes, it was very violent. In some days, they would have massive gladiator game events where literally hundreds of people would die in the arena in some days. Oftentimes, these violent contests were held among slaves. In other cases, they were held among prisoners. With some of the more sadistic emperors, they even would you know, single out certain groups, most notably with Emperor Nero. He would single out Christians and have them murdered in these gladiator contests. Another popular form of entertainment in the Roman world was the circus. Now, we have a conception in our modern world of what the circus is like. We think about clowns and acrobats and animals and things like that. Those were an extension of what the original purpose of the circus was. The original word circus comes from the Roman word circuit, which is actually a form of chariot race. The Romans would hold these massive chariot races at big events like the Circus Maximus. So the Colosseum is the most well-known building in Roman society in Rome, and it's true, it was massive. The Colosseum could hold up to about 50,000 people. But what people don't know is that the Circus Maximus could hold up to 250,000 people. This was a massive venue where, again, it was primarily used for chariot races. Now, as an extension of that, they would also, in between the races, they would have these little halftime show type things where they would have animals and jugglers and acrobats and things like that. And that's where our modern conception of the circus, like the Ringling Brothers Circus, that's where that comes from. A lot of times in Roman society, they would actually combine those two events, the gladiator contests 
and then the circuses. Um, they would combine them into one big massive event to keep the people happy. Finally, the last form of public entertainment that we'll talk about was the public bath. Um, this was something that was a little more common among the wealthier classes in Rome, but the public bath was usually just some form of a warm bathtub that they would have for the people. Kind of almost like a public pool, only probably usually a little bit warmer. It was a place where Roman men and women would go to socialize with one another and share the day's gossip, while also, you know, helping to maintain a certain degree of cleanliness. Obviously, they weren't the same level of cleanliness that we are in today's world, but they were certainly a step above many of their other contemporary societies. So just to go through some pictures here, um, you know, some of these are actual photos, some of these are paintings and depictions, but what you can see on the screen right here are some of those things that I talked about in the previous screen. Uh, on the screen right here, I'm circling it. This is an example of a public bath. Um, appropriately and ironically uh, located in the town of Bath, England. Um, England itself was colonized by the Romans during their period of emperor bu empire building. But you had that. Uh, this right here is a depiction of a gladiator contest. Some of you are well aware, but the, you know, a really unfortunate aspect of the violent nature of the Roman gladiator games is that not only would they have men fight one another, they would oftentimes have men fight against wild animals. And they would import animals from all corners of their empire. Most notably, a lot of lions, a lot of tigers, and a lot of bears that they would bring in to fight against these gladiators. And they would oftentimes rig the competition, especially if it was, you know, a group of prisoners or something like that. Really, really violent and unfortunate stuff. But reminiscent of the way that we treat athletic contests now, right? You gather these big, massive crowds together, and they'll either be cheering on one side or another. This photo in the lower left right here, this is a modern photo of the inside of the Roman Colosseum. We'll take a look at some more pictures of the outside of the Colosseum again. But again, you have to imagine yourself back then in, in, you know, in, the, first century, um, in the first century CE, where you had this massive building. This was unlike anything the world had ever seen before, being able to congregate that many people in one place at one given time. And then in the lower right, you see here this picture. This is the Circus Maximus. Like I said, that was the racetrack used for chariot racing. And the Circus Maximus itself was actually located right next to the Emperor's Palace in Rome. So the Emperor kind of had like, he had the most prestigious box seat at this, uh, at this Circus Maximus. Pretty cool stuff. Next thing we want to talk about in Roman society was education. Education was very highly valued in Roman society. Um, they had, in certain parts of their empire, some of the highest rates of literacy in the world. It was estimated that in the second century CE, the literacy rate within the city of Rome itself was close to 20%. Which again, to us, that sounds like, well, only 20% of the people could read? That sucks. But again, think back. In that point in time in the world, Having a population where 20% of the people could read was really, really good. Um, most children were taught at home, so they did not have public schools or anything like that yet. They didn't have public schools where everyone would go together. Most children were what you would call homeschooled. Not by their mothers and fathers, but oftentimes by tutors hired from other places throughout the empire. I think I mentioned in my last video that a lot of times slaves... Uh, were brought in from the places that Rome had conquered, and some of the wealthier or more well-educated men and women from those places would be used as tutors for Roman children. All right, and then oftentimes, again, there were obviously differences in the nature of that education. Um, boys were taught to speak both Latin, which was the language of the Roman Empire, and Greek, which was the language of the eastern half of the Roman Empire. Places like Egypt, Greece, Anatolia, um, the Eastern Mediterranean, those places all spoke Greek languages. Uh, they were also taught math and they were taught public speaking was very important in Roman education as well. Because think about it, they still valued some aspects of their indirect democracy. They still wanted to be able to influence one another, so public speaking was very important. 
On the flip side of that, girls were more taught traditional housekeeping type activities. Although some of them were taught to read and write, we do have some instances of that in Roman society. All right, let's talk about religion a little bit. This is the last topic I'm going to get into. Roman religion was very, very heavily influenced and based on Greek polytheistic religion. Much like the Greeks, the Romans had their own, a whole pantheon of gods that were responsible for different aspects of their life and of their society. And just like the Greeks, the Roman mythology and their different stories would serve to explain natural phenomena, qualities that humans have, and different life events. Just like the Greeks also, their gods had different, um, different flaws to them. They weren't seen as perfect individuals. The Roman gods and goddesses oftentimes had counterparts on the Greek end of those gods and goddesses. In fact, Greek influence on the Roman gods and goddesses started very, very early in Roman history. Because remember, in Italy, in addition to the city of Rome, you had a lot of Greek colonies there in Italy. All of those gods had equivalents. So for instance, I listed there Jupiter. His equivalent was Zeus. He was the king of the gods. Juno, her equivalent was Hera, the queen of the gods, queen of the goddesses. All right, you had Apollo. He was probably the only Roman god who adapted the same name from Greek mythology. Diana, her equivalent was the Greek goddess Artemis, the goddess of the hunt. Minerva, her equivalent was the Greek goddess uh, Athena, the goddess of wisdom and protection. Venus was the equivalent of Aphrodite, the goddess of love. Mars, the equivalent of Ares, the god of war. And Neptune, the equivalent of Poseidon, the god of the sea. All right, and another big important aspect of Roman religion was these public religious festivals. They would hold a lot of holidays and religious celebrations where they would get the entire city out together to worship the gods and practice and in some cases do animal sacrifice. All right. This tied in to that whole aspect of providing public entertainment for their people. All right, finally, talking a little bit more about religion in Rome. First of all, another important thing to understand was, especially in the time of the empire, of the Roman Empire, there was a strong link between the government and the religion. And it was something known as, and I'm going to highlight it right here, the imperial cult. The imperial cult were people that worshipped the emperor as a god. They saw the emperor as a god himself. Now, it was interesting. They didn't necessarily believe that while the emperor was alive that he was a god, but rather once they would pass, once they would die, they then began to build temples to them and worship them as gods. This started with the worship of Caesar and Augustus, and you would see, and they would build these massive temples dedicated to the emperor, all around their empire, especially in lands in the eastern part of their empire where they were, they felt maybe threatened by other religions. Specifically, we'll start talking about how Christianity affected that in another video. But again, they would build these temples all over their empire. Uh, this one right here on your screens is actually a temple to Augustus located in Turkey. All right. They also thought that they had certain spirits that overlooked their families. They called these lares, and they had these people known as augurs. These were kind of like priests. Their jobs were to interpret the signs from the gods. And then finally, they also, as they conquered other parts of their empire, the Romans did something pretty smart. They began to borrow gods, goddesses, and religious customs from the regions that they conquered so that those people would feel more assimilated into the Roman religion. They didn't necessarily force their religion on these other people entirely. They said, look, let's take some aspects of your religion and then you can integrate it into our religion to help you integrate further into Roman society. You saw this with a lot of the Celtic pagan religions in areas like France and Britain. You saw this with the Egyptian religions. They oftentimes found equivalents of the Egyptian gods and goddesses with their own. You would even see this in parts of the world like Persia, where the Roman Empire reached its furthest extent. Now, there was one religion where they had a lot of trouble with this, trying to integrate that religion into the Roman religion, 
and that again specifically was Christianity. Christianity had a difficult time integrating into the Roman religious system because it is a monotheistic religion. In other words, they only believe in one God. And most early Christians held pretty firmly to that belief. And in our next video, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about how that created a big conflict between Christians and the Roman Empire. So in summary, all right, just recapping what we talked about in this video, public entertainment was a big important part of Roman society, it used to distract the masses. You had the gladiator games, the circuses, the public bathing centers, all of these things used to help provide a distraction, which you still see in our world today. Not necessarily that it's used to entirely distract us from the poor, awful parts of our lives, but more the fact that public education is very, I mean, excuse me, public entertainment is very much valued. We have sporting events, we have movies, we have theater, we have all these things that people go out and do together. Another thing we covered, again, education and literacy very highly valued in Roman society. And then finally, when it comes to Roman religion, remember, we covered the fact that their gods and goddesses were most heavily influenced and borrowed from Greek religion their Greek polytheistic gods and goddesses. They borrowed from other parts of the empire as they began to conquer those regions, and you began to see not only more gods and goddesses integrated into their religion, but you also saw this link between the government and religion, where they worshiped the emperor as a god himself. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Again, please go back and check out the other videos that I have in this playlist on the Roman world and Christianity. Like I mentioned, we're actually going to start getting into the Christianity aspect of it with my next video. Hope to see you guys again soon. Hope you guys are taking care and staying sane and staying safe out there. All right. Have a good one, guys. Later.